Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca rylon Berry, a clinical psychologist in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the director of the Tics, Tourette Disorder, and Trichotillomania program at the Child Study Center. If your child has been diagnosed with Tics or Tourette Disorder, you might be wondering what this means for your child and family. We have two special guests today, Casey and her son Jonah, who will share their experiences in being diagnosed with Tourette Disorder, seeking treatment, and getting the support at home and at school. Casey is the executive director of Kangoo, a nonprofit that helps pregnant women survive childbirth. Jonah is a second grader and is a proud member of the Tourette Association of America and says hi to all of his friends out there who are watching this. Welcome. Remember, you can submit questions at any time today by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. That's on the right side of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of our presentation. Okay. So to begin, we're gonna be focusing today on what families should know to get the help they need about tics and Tourette's disorder. I'll first provide a brief overview of some key functions or key factors that we know about tics and Tourette's disorder, including diagnosis and briefly about treatment. And finally, we'll spend the majority of our time today discussing Casey and Jonah's experience with tackling tics, including their own way of managing them and home and school um, involvement as well. So first, to begin, we know that tics or Tourette disorder is a neurological, not, not psychological condition characterized by repetitive stereotype uh, and involuntary movements and vocalizations that we refer to as tics. The average onset occurs fairly early in childhood around ages four and six, with males being affected about two to five or four times more than female counterparts. The severity of the disorder can range with mild to moderate tics being much more common than severe presentations. And in fact, we usually see the worst tic symptoms occur in early teens and with many individuals seeing improvements into late adolescence and adulthood. Many, there are many common conditions that will co-occur with tics and Tourette disorder, including ADHD, OCD symptoms, and anxiety. Some of the key factors in diagnosing Tourette disorder relate to the number of tics present and whether or not they're vocal or motor and how long these have last. And if we take a look at some of the uh, criteria for other types of tic disorders at the bottom of the screen in blue compared to the criteria for Tourette disorder in orange, we see that really what's different there again is whether or not there are only vocal or motor tics and if these have been present for a year or more. So some of the examples of tics that we see, and keep in mind that we typically will start to see kids presenting with simple motor tics first, and that these can often expand down the body into the trunk area and sometimes forming into more um, complex motor tics. So these can range from anything and are not limited to uh, eye blinking, eye movements, some facial grimacing, head jerks or movements, or some children will initially present with some simple vocal tics, a coughing, throat clearing, some sniffling, which can be mistaken for some as a reaction to an allergy or just a typical common cold. So for this reason, because initially some of these vocal, simple vocal and motor tics can seem like parts of other conditions, if a family presents to a pediatrician or let's say um, family care provider or an allergist, they might initially be told to watch and wait uh, to see if these uh, initial tics can uh, subside on their own. And for most people or for most children, I would say that's actually what indeed happens. And then there's a small subsect of individuals wherein they continue to demonstrate these tic behaviors um, and Tourette disorder um, for a longer term. So it's not uncommon to be diagnosed only after the symptoms have been present for some time, maybe even a year or more. So um, it's important just for parents to, to keep in mind and, and to keep a watchful eye on some of these behaviors, again, to see if they are persistent and maybe are reflective of something other than a seasonal allergy or as part of another type of condition. And it is very natural for us to see that ticks will wax and wane or come and go over time, and they will vary in terms of the type or where they occur in the body, um, and they will also vary in terms of their severity, and, and sometimes that can be dependent upon um, the time of the child's life or the, the environment where it's at, but sometimes not. Um, it really can just be kind of a, a random thing where they occur in this fractal quality, or they can occur, you know, a lot of the time or a little. 
Um, as I mentioned before, we usually see the first signs of tics happen in the head and the neck and then move further down into the body, into the muscles of the trunk and to the extremities and sometimes from there developing into the more complex tics. Um, one important point that I wanted to emphasize regarding you know, how many individuals will continue along with this disorder over time. Again, we see the peak severity happen in the mid-teen years and that majority of folks will see improvement into the late adolescence and early adulthood, and yet still about 10 to 15 percent of folks will continue to experience this from a more chronic standpoint into adulthood. Okay. Um, we can see some linkages between um, the environment and stress, anxiety, um, and the exacerbation of tics. And we, we do have a lot of folks noting that, that their tics are improved when they're engaged in an activity that really requires them to be mindfully focused and where they're using a lot of their motor control. Um, and a lot of folks find that after physical activity, they, they feel that the tics are improved. Um, for the most part, we, we do see a cessation of tics during sleep, but not completely eliminated. Um, an important point to distinguish is that tics are something that we consider to be involuntary. They're not anything that an individual does on purpose or with intent. Um, however, some people can be confused because they see that, it, in fact, some individuals can suppress their tics or hold them in for periods of time. And, in fact, uh, we actually do not recommend that because that can, and for many people, lead to a buildup of, of the actual urge itself, but also some frustration emotionally. And so it's really important that educators and parents understand that this isn't something that can be uh, snapped off with the, the click of a button, um, but that it is, you know, something that takes a lot of emotional and physical energy to really manage. So just briefly, some of the most effective ways that we have, uh, you know, seen to treat ticks, the first one being a, um, our most uh, researched behavioral intervention called the Com Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks, which involves uh, four phases of treatment that I can expand upon a little bit later during our Q&A portion. Uh, a few of the pharmacological interventions that have shown to have some efficacy are clonidine and guanfacine. And with regard to the medication interventions for ticks, we have to remember this is, can be hit or miss because there can be side effects for many individuals, and we really do not have any one medication that has been helpful to everyone um, or that can completely eliminate symptoms. Okay, so now, uh, now that we have um, our background information on Tourette's disorder, I really want to shift our focus to getting the inside scoop from Casey and from Jonah on your experience with, um, you know, working through and living with this condition and, 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 you know, what you recommend to other families to get help. Um, so first, um, I want to know for you, Casey, get your perspective on when did you first notice some of Jonah's symptoms? Yeah, sure. So it was very much as you just described. Um, we started noticing them. Oh, yeah. Right. When he, yeah, well, actually, I noticed them a little bit earlier when he was about, when you were about four years old. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that, but that's when we really started to notice yeah. them. And later, I that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. they were, as you said, you know, started as motor, mm -hmm. so blinks. Um, head shaking, um, and then as he got a little bit older, five, six, around years old, probably second grade is when the motor, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, vocal tics. No, he mm -hmm. started in around kindergarten. I'm going to answer my questions and then you can answer your stuff about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then they started, you know, vocal. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were, you know, some yelps, and that's when I think mm -hmm. um, we went again to the pediatrician and mm -hmm. she said, well, this looks like more than just ticks, mm -hmm. um, it's probably Tourette's, um, mm -hmm. and that's when we officially got the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Wait, when? In first grade? About second grade. Wait, no, I thought I was diagnosed. Oh, I was diagnosed with ticks, but not Tourette's. You got mm -hmm. it. So ticks first. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, just as you said, we waited and mm -hmm. we watched to see if it developed mm -hmm. um, into more complex ticks, mm -hmm. and it, it did. Mm -hmm. And so then we got the diagnosis of Tourette's. Mm -hmm. And at the point where you, you said that the, the noises of the vocalizations were happening in the classroom, mm -hmm. what was your thinking then about wanting to get more attention to this? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that that was really the moment where we understood that this was something we needed to understand better mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. it was something that was noticed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the thing about dress is once you understand what it is, um, it's very easy to mm -hmm. ignore. And ultimately, 
that's the message right. we wanted to give to the right. people around Jonah, to his classmates, ignore to it. his teachers, is mm -hmm. ignore, ignore it. it. Mm -hmm. um, but if people aren't educated about what it is, then, um, you know, it would be natural for a teacher to be surprised, to maybe even think it's on purpose, right. and punish the child, and punish the child. Right. And so for acting out or disruptive. For acting behavior, out, right. for being disruptive. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we really quickly understood that the best thing we could do is to educate his classmates mm -hmm. um, and to sensitize the teachers to what was happening, what mm -hmm. it was, what it isn't, mm -hmm. um, and essentially how to deal with it. That's, that's wonderful. And we really wanted to make it something in the classroom that everybody felt comfortable with talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we to talked normalize about it to normalize it. happening and, and not mm -hmm. something that needs to be made a big deal of. Exactly, and yeah. particularly, I think at, it how it is. Yeah, <laughs> at that age, um, you know, kids uh, love information, and they're very kind-hearted. Mm -hmm. And his classmates, you know, had a lot of great questions for him. Um, does it hurt when you tick? Mm -hmm. you stop ticking, mm -hmm. and once they understood better, you know, it kind of became a non-issue. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. What kind of resources or research did you do on your own in seeking a doctor or, or treatment? Otherwise, sure. So. Um, I'll, I'll absolutely talk about that. So, um, you know, the first thing we probably did was go to the internet, mm -hmm. um, and that can be helpful as well as overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and so pretty quickly I reached out to the Tread Association of America, mm -hmm. and they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke with... You probably got to that website immediately because it's called Tourette.org. It's a good right. website. Right. It is. It's a great website. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to connect with other parents um, who had kids uh, who have Tourette. Mm -hmm. um, particularly parents who have kids who are now older. It was really mm -hmm. helpful for me to connect with others. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to have Jonah meet um, other kids with Tourette's by going to a, a Tourette Association meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the Tourette Association also gave us some really good resources mm -hmm. about how to engage with the school. They have a packet of information. I mm -hmm. think they'll even send somebody to the school. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were a tremendous resource in, you know, understanding Tourette's for ourselves and then helping the people in our community and the people around us understand mm -hmm. it too. Yes. And I know that they have the sort of in-school consultants or the educational yeah. consultants who can go in and give different types of webinars or, you know, to teachers or to the classrooms themselves and involve the yeah. child as well. Yeah. So that's a wonderful resource for home. What other support systems did you find that you, you both utilized at home? At yeah. So I think at home, um, you know, I, I mean, I think it's kind of what I mentioned mm -hmm. before. The biggest thing for us was to was for Jonah to have a language and an understanding yeah. of um, what his body and brain do and, and why, mm -hmm. um, for him to be able to describe it to us was very helpful. We talked to his sister about it, so she understood why sometimes he may make noises or make certain movements. Mm -hmm. I don't um, think you really yeah, I think she, you, she you know, wasn't doing anything to, to make it worse. She wasn't very surprised by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. No? Okay. Um, and then at school, you know, we talked to his teachers, his specialists, mm -hmm. and he himself did the presentation to his classmates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah. And Jonah, what was that like for you to be able to engage your classmates in knowing something about you and for giving them this information. Did you feel that that was helpful? Well, can you repeat that? Did you feel it was helpful for you to talk to your classmates about what you were going through or some of the things that were happening for you? Definitely. Mm -hmm. The best way to do a the best way to go, as mm -hmm. my mom says, is just to normalize it. Mm -hmm. So I think right. the presentation I gave my help, mm -hmm. classmates really helped normalize, mm -hmm. it, right. normalize it. I think that's a really great point. So it sounds like um, enhancing awareness to those around you, the important people in your life, friends, classmates, teachers, anybody um, that you yeah. might interact with is really key. Um, so along those lines, you had mentioned, okay, so treatment for you, you feel like it wasn't something – it's unnecessary. It, it wasn't something that you found to be necessary for you. I want to ask mom, what do you think are some questions families can ask in determining if treatment, you know, what treatment is right for them and 
if they want to go that route? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, so for us, bottom line, it was really about um, helping Jonah understand himself, mm -hmm. um, his body, and his brain, and ultimately to have him love who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is really what guided our treatment options. It mm -hmm. always sort of came down to that. And mm -hmm. what we tell, and you know, Jonah, I think, um, I know you don't like the word treatment, right? Because you don't want your, your Tourette's to change. So another way to think about it is, you know, maybe management. How do you manage mm -hmm. um, or how do we manage um, a family where Tourette's is part of it? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what we say is that there are wonderful experts in the world who have studied this. Um, and Jonah is an expert on himself. Mm -hmm. And so we try to sort of pull that all together when mm -hmm. we think about um, how to best learn about Tourette's. Right. And so what I'm, you know, what I'm seeing and hearing from you, Jonah, already is that you are very confident in knowing what is happening in your body, and you feel like you're you managing it with several great resources um, at hand, which I think is really neat, and I think a nice model to how you know to incorporate several different components into just working with the child and with the family yeah. too. And what we, you know, you mentioned in the beginning that there's CBIT, um, mm -hmm. there's some medications. You know, mm -hmm. what what we've told Jonah is. Um, there's stuff out there to mm -hmm. the extent that you ever might want to change um, right. your tips. There's there are plenty of things we can do right. if that ever becomes a possibility. Right. And then we've left it mm -hmm. that. And just in speaking on that point, even when families come in for treatment, if if the child doesn't fear that it's interfering, or sorry, if the child doesn't feel that it's interfering or feel that it's causing distress, then sometimes we do say, okay, yeah. let's wait a bit until you feel like you are ready to really engage in this because treatment itself can take a lot of effort and, and you're really working on modifying several things. So if we, we really want to go with what the child and of course what the family feels is yeah. best in that moment. Mm -hmm. so, I, just, so Jonah, if I could shift our attention to you and just get a little bit more information about your experience, what does it feel like for you to tick? So basically here's how your brain gets you to tick. Mm -hmm. So your brain so, so basically, the child feels very bad right when they're about to tick. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by bad? Like, just like, like, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. like, you feel a little bit of a force, like a little hot and tingly force. Not like hot feeling. and tingly. Mm -hmm. More like just like tension. A buildup, mm -hmm. build mm -hmm. like I can literally feel it, and then when I take it, it feels better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you get a sense of relief when you were originally feeling uncomfortable, and that's what yeah. the tick does. Yeah, so when right? you try to suppress a tick, that tension keeps on building up. Right, right. So I really don't think the, ch the child should try to suppress the tick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't really think. What was the question again? Oh, just how does it feel to tick? What's in, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think so, you've done a really nice job. Here. And I don't really, so I don't really think the child to, should suppress the tick. Mm -hmm. And and parents probably shouldn't go to any treatments that involve trying to suppress. Right, right. In fact, that's actually one of the, the things that we do talk to parents about, to not expect their child to just control it or stop it or suppress it because that can yeah. lead to some other things. Instead, we want to just, like you guys have really emphasized a lot, ignore them and, and also try and modify the environment to the best extent possible to really help the child be successful and complete the activities that they need to. And so part of the, the work that we do is, is working with families to make sure that if, if ticks are happening a lot in school and if kids are responding to that, we try and take away the reinforcement that the, they might be giving to the ticks to see if that helps to lessen them so as I well. I guess you shouldn't modify the ticks. Instead, you should modify people's reactions. We, mo we modify yeah. people's reactions. We can modify the environment to help you feel more, like we so showed in that other slide, help you feel more engaged in the activity. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to hear from you. So we're saying, okay, to parents, don't tell your kids to suppress the ticks. I'm saying to not tell them to ever just stop or just to cut it out because that doesn't work. What are some ways that you think our parents can help their kids manage these things? How can parents respond? the presence of ticks. So I think parents 
should really ask the kid to not worry about the ticks, to just check it's fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. To just kind of be yourself, be with your body. Yeah. To go with it. Mm -hmm. and, fine. Okay. Um, how did you deal or how do you deal with some of the stress and frustration that, you know, may come up with ticks or just may come up with other things like at school? I just do something that requires a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. So you really try and engage in something that makes you feel good to help you kind of cope with that stress. No, mm -hmm. not good, just some, just something, anything that requires mm -hmm. a lot of focus. Okay. If, if the ticks come up in your classroom, what do you do then? What are some things that might help? Well, if they come up in the classroom, then the ticks will probably already be normalized. Mm -hmm. so everybody mm -hmm. to them. Right. So we just kind of keep going on with yeah. our work. Mm -hmm. Do you have any type of strategies that you like to do at your desk to help you work through them? Or you just kind of just, you know that, okay, I've got to focus on my work and get it done. The ticks don't really distract me. Oh, okay. So you've really done a great job of working through them. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Something that's been helpful, I think, um, as a parent, and I think it has been helpful at school too, mm -hmm. too is, um, you know, ticks are always changing. Um, and what causes the tick sometimes change. So in the case of mm -hmm. Jonah, and you know, I didn't know this until until Jonah told me, mm -hmm. but quiet voices, like um, a whisper or a quiet voice or sort of a gentle touch, all mm -hmm. of those will often make him tick. Also, mm -hmm. whenever she tries to kiss me, I really don't like that. Mm -hmm. That too. So that'll start um, mm -hmm. a tick like like that and one. And mm -hmm. usually the things that trigger the ticks also also the child really doesn't like, like kind of pain the child mm -hmm. in a weird way. Mm -hmm. It sounds like I'm hearing that, and this is true for many folks, that when um, a child feels overstimulated by something, that sometimes can lead to more ticks. And also on the opposite end of that, when a kiddo feels bored, mm -hmm. we sometimes see more ticks coming up as well. Yeah. And so what we would do in working with families is we were trying to point out, okay, what types of activities in your world or day are leading to those two emotions or what, what people in the environment are around, and we try to make modifications and, and work through that. So, Jonah, you have provided some amazing answers and feedback for us. Do you have any other advice for a child that recently learned that they have Tourette's disorder? Uh, well, I would advise them to just try to normalize it and act like it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. I think that's one of the, it shows a really just great. Just pretend that everybody knows what it is mm -hmm. until everybody does know what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's a really great strength. Have well, you ever had to, I mean, it sounds like the response from your classmates and from your school has been one that's really open mm -hmm. and receptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's been great. Um, I think, you know, Jonah created a presentation mm -hmm. um, that talked about what dress is, what his ticks are. Mm -hmm. He led a great... Um, we can give that to other people. It could really help them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there was an exercise he had he, he did where he sort of had kids, had the class sing, um, row, row, row your vote uh -huh. once, you know, just yeah. straight, and then they sang it again, and every time he clapped, the instructions were all the kids would do like a head shaking tick. Oh, to see what it's like to, to have the what interference of a tick. Yeah. yeah. That's a new I haven't heard of that. I've yeah. heard the American I flag exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really neat. I think that's incredible. And Joe, how do you think, what do you think that sort of taught your classmates or what do you think mm -hmm. they experienced? Well, I just think they experience what it's like to tick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can see how hard it is to to have to move away from something that you're doing to engage in another activity and then try to go back. It isn't to actually that hard. I just mm -hmm. it. it sounds like you've really done a great job of working with your ticks and managing them and knowing you know how to best navigate your work and in the classroom. I'm very very impressed. They don't really distract me. Mm -hmm. I just tick while I'm doing mm -hmm. the work. Right. So one They're just kind of like something in the background. Mm -hmm. So, Jonathan, do you and, and your family have really found some great benefits um, from the 
Detroit Association of America, we wanted to include their information here as a really uh, a resource for families to get in contact with. And as I had mentioned, this is a, a place where you can get uh, research information, but also education for yourselves, for schools. Um, you can get support and connection to other families. And um, like Joni, you can be a part of uh, an ambassador for TAA, and that could be you know, having some involvement in just meeting other kids who are going through this, or you can go to a I different am, level. I am. Actually. I know. I know you are. And you can kind of go to the, the annual meeting in Washington, D.C., so there are a lot of ways to get involved there. Um, some families also find it helpful to watch a documentary that I believe was sponsored by the TAA um, called I Have Tourette's, But Tourette's Doesn't Have Me. And I do want to mention that um, the, the TAA can also provide any number of slides and webinars and, and things for school as well. So, okay, so now with just a few minutes left, um, I'd like to actually move to any questions that we have uh, from our audience. All right, let me your hand, Joan, if you can help this with me. Okay, so our first question is, what is the right therapy for a child with a coughing tick? Now, again, just going with what we have discussed before, if we find that the coughing tick hasn't uh, gone away naturally, and I, I, many parents who actually have kiddos who are coughing or throat clearing might check with an allergist first to see, and they may give throat lozenges and, and different types of medicines in that way. And if it's still persistent, if it's still coming back, and if we see that it might be influenced by the environment, as I had mentioned before, um, one of the things that we would do in the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks is we would teach an awareness to triggers. We would try to modify the environment, as I said, to see if we can reduce the onset of the tick that way. And then the third phase of that treatment would be what we call teaching a tick blocker or a competing response. Um, so what that would be is we would try to help the child Again, understand when they're having that buildup or that tension that Jonah mentioned, and then we would have them learn to engage in a different behavior. And with coughing ticks or with any actual vocal tick, we teach a type of breathing, and that will depend on how the, the, the vocalization is coming out. But usually um, different breathing exercises where the child is taught to hold it for a minute or until the urge goes away, and you do that repeatedly, can often be a helpful way. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, uh I, I really don't think you should you should try to stop a tick if mm -hmm. it isn't causing a problem since right. since believe it or not uh take ticks that aren't causing a problem can actually help right. you stop ticks that are ca ca causing a problem mm -hmm. so basically so here's how I can actually get rid of ticks mm -hmm. and it works See? So basically, if there is one tick mm -hmm. that's causing a problem and another tick that's similar to it or just feels kind of like it, mm -hmm. then then instead, mm -hmm. then when you feel the urge to do that tick, mm -hmm. you can do the other tick that is similar to it. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the tick that's causing a problem will go away. Mm -hmm. You make a great point, and, and believe it or not, you actually are sort of leading into our next question, which is, is there a way to keep the Tourette's? And that's kind of what you said, like, I don't want to change that, um, but change the, the, the way that the ticks look or change how interfering they are if they tend to maybe cause some distress or some, you know, like uh, interference. Corona. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If they that maybe are considered uh, inappropriate for the environment. So I think what Joan is mentioning, actually, you are describing um, what I was kind of doing, too, which is you find a way to kind of catch the tick, right, and do something else, do a behavior that might be less noticeable or might be more accessible to you, meaning you can do it anywhere in the world. Right. Well, sometimes in, by another tick, I, I might teach kiddos to do something else, um, like do you know that they wouldn't even see in class, like do some breathing, or they might touch, you know, squeeze their fist or something. Again, um, there are ways that we can go about it so that you can learn um, different types of behaviors that might not draw so attention or might not interfere with certain things. Yeah, but I think doing another tick will. That means. It's guaranteed that mm -hmm. the marriage will be suppressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. So I want to really say 
and kind of agree with you too that t learning how to be aware of them and to, to work on implementing a competing response or what we would call a tick, not a tick blocker in the sense that we want to suppress, but doing something else, a tick replacer maybe is a better word for it. Okay, so I'm going to move on to our very last question because we are almost out of time. Okay, my daughter screams really loud and her older sister gets upset. How do we talk to siblings Wait, about this? Uh, which one has threat syndrome? So the, the, the one daughter, um, the youngest daughter screams really loud and her older sister gets upset. How do we talk to siblings about this? Wait, screams very loud because of threat? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She has a vocal, a tick, screaming tick, or a yelp. Wait, why would the older sister get upset? No, the, the older sister gets upset that her younger sister maybe is calling out and, you know, interrupting things with the scream. Do you remember how you talk to your, you have a sister, is that right? Yeah, but she is just kind of used to it. Okay, she's used to it. Do you remember how you introduced that? Yeah, to? so, I mean, one of the things, um, you know, we explained to his sister mm -hmm. what trust was. We explained that the ticks weren't something that he could control, mm -hmm. and I think that helped her understand it mm -hmm. a little bit better. And then um, one of the things we ultimately did was move them into separate bedrooms, mm -hmm. um, and so that was mm -hmm. um, then she wouldn't be kept awake if that were the case. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of modifying the environment if you can to yeah. really help reduce, you know, for both her mm -hmm. and for Jonah as well, some of the the things that may come up around this. I think oh, that's a I great thought someone just liked sleeping in that bed. <laughs> I think both. Maybe she probably. Was just separation and being able to kind of own your own activities and create an identity yeah. elsewhere can be yeah. helpful as well. And I, uh, I would just add if I have, um, you know, that we also were aware that um, Jonah was getting a lot of attention um, mm -hmm. and that Very his funny. little sister, you know, at one like point, mm -hmm. she didn't like it. At one point she asked the pediatrician if, if she might get, have Tourette's or get Tourette's because she was really hoping yeah, to have she it. Yeah, right. she really right. want, mm -hmm. wanted to and she still wants to get Tourette's syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that is one of the things that we do educate parents about, that the, even the more negative forms of attention can reinforce or exacerbate the tick. So we want to make sure that we are focusing on giving attention when Jonah is doing great things, creative things, or, you know, start to even engage him in a more meaningful activity so that maybe the ticks realize, oh, I'm not going to get reinforced for doing this thing. Um, the last thing I want to add just for how to talk to a sibling about just adding on to your really nice commentary, Casey, is again, so we're, we're just normalizing it, we're giving education that this is a neurological condition, it's not intentional, and that saying stop it, it's, it's going to make it worse most of the time. So what we can do instead is help the sibling learn ways to cope, if that's applicable, um, separate when necessary, and then of course get the sibling, if possible, to help engage the other sibling in a more meaningful task or to distract them with something that's more fun. But we're, I, I sometimes tell families, we don't need to mention the, the T word. We don't need to say it. Instead, let's live life. Let's enjoy each other, right? And again, sometimes that can be helpful and not actually reinforcing yeah. the behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you both so, so much. It was really <gasps> helpful and insightful to hear how you've experienced this and how you are really doing such a fantastic job managing it. Thanks and for having us. Of course. Okay. So um, just on behalf of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, thank you for joining us today. Um, once you leave the webinar, you will receive a survey, and we would appreciate it if you could complete that for us. You will also receive a follow-up email within a, a day or two with a link to the recording of today's presentation. And we hope you can join us for our next session, Choosing the Right Summer Program Bye. for Your Child, with Dr. Karen Fleiss on May 22nd at 1 p.m. Thanks again. Bye. <laughs> Bye.